interesting afternoon here at the Kip Christus Stendhal Memorial Lecture. And uh, we are very pleased and very honored to have Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf as our speaker this year. And we will introduce you a bit more later. But first, just to say a few words about what kind of occasion this is. Um, Christus Stendhal Memorial Lecture is arranged by the Center for Interfaith Dialogue in the Diocese of Stockholm, where that's where I work. I'm Helena Engnell, Bishop's Advisor at the Diocese. We do this together with Paideia, the European Institute for Jewish Studies in Sweden, run by um, Barbara Specter, who sits over there. And I think we have quite a few of the students of Paideia here. Why don't you just uh, show who you are? Yeah, very warm welcome to you and to everyone else who has gathered here. Christus Stendhal was the Bishop of Stockholm for four years in the mid-80s. Four years is not a very long time, but I would say that Christus Stendhal made an impact on the Church of Sweden and perhaps even Swedish society in a way that goes well beyond that time space. Uh, Bishop Christer, he was uh, a biblical scholar studied the New Testament, and his studies of the New Testament led him to investigate and appreciate the Jewish background, the Jewish heritage, and also to a wider interest in interfaith dialogue. He spent most of his career as a professor and dean of Harvard Divinity School, uh, but then he came here to spend the last four years of his uh, working life here. And uh, when he died a couple of years ago, now six years ago, I think we said that we want to honor the memory of Christer and how he brought the issues of interfaith dialogue into Church of Sweden, into th those were questions that was, were not really very, very important, I would say. Before, before he came, but he, he really took them up in a very good way. And we're so pleased to have Britta Stendhal and Anna here, his widow and his daughter. It's really great that you can be with us today. Uh, this is the fifth le lecture, and um, this will be the first time that we have a Muslim speaker. And uh, when we thought about who would we like to invite, we asked people we, we know who are Islamic, Islamologists and who have a great knowledge of who is uh, who is uh, uh, the right person to to invite to such a lecture who can give us some ideas of thoughts that are going on in in the Muslim world today. We asked a few friends and John Henningson of the Foreign Office uh, came up with the idea said that. Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, he's the right man for you. So now I'll ask John to tell us why we should listen to Imam Faisal. <laughs> is this working? Yes, yes it is. I decided to take the lecture myself. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to explain to you why we should listen to Imam uh, Faisal Abdelhouf. You will soon discover it. I'll just keep you waiting for a while. Who is a prophet? In Latin, the noun prophet it has feminine form but masculine gender. So it's obviously uh, an inclusive term. In the Semitic languages, uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. One of the connotations of this, uh, this verb, naba'a, naba'a, is to burst forth like water from a wellspring or truth from the mouth of young children. A prophet offers a scathing diagnosis of the present and its diseases. He or she speaks fearlessly into the ears of kings, presidents, priests, and generals. 
and teachers. In 2004, Imam Faisal published this book with the uh, then rather surprising title, What's Right with Islam is What is Right with America. And here, my friends, you should read this, although I'm sure he himself will wave this one later. But here he cuts through these fruitless hedges of polemics and self-justification, and he goes straight to the, to the core. Shared values, rediscovered in shared history, shared identities, and shared destiny. He points to the kinship between the six objectives of Sharia, which I'm sure you will explain if, if need be, and what the Declaration of Independence from the United States of America calls the unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm afraid, um, as a Swedish diplomat, to say that it's rather, it would be rather difficult to write a similar text in Europe today, despite the advances of the European Union. The acclaim for this book was wide and immediate. Uh, a newspaper in Dallas, Texas wrote, this is like drinking fresh water in a desert of rising international radicalism. And it was echoed by a Muslim intellectual like Sayyid Hussein Nasr and many other scholars, Jewish, Christian and Muslim. Perhaps I should also mention here uh, Rabbi uh, Schneider of New York, who was one of those who has supported you in uh, all what, we have, what you have done, I think, not only your writings. The timeliness of your message uh, has been borne out, also on the political level, by the so-called movement of moderates. This is an initiative based on an, an idea that you launched, I think, is it seven years ago or something? Even further? Well, that, that's another question. That's another question. You can, <laughs> you can go into the, uh, the uh, back, historical background of this, but it has been adopted by the government of Malaysia and been institutionalized, operationalized since then. One attentive reader of yours, it turns out, was the young Senator Barack Obama. Uh, uh, and when he, as president, gave his famous speech at the Azad University in Cairo in June 2009, he drew heavily upon the program that you have outlined here. And if it were not for the uh, eagerness of the audience, I would quote the, pro the points in your program, which are exactly what he took as the main pillars of a new American policy he said, in the Muslim world. For example, economic freedom and rule of law. Let me just mention one that is really prophetic. That is when you underline that the military should not interfere in the affairs of governance. It was true then and it is as true today. A prophet speaks the truth to unwilling listeners, and then you may have to pay a high price. You paid a price when you launched the idea of a multi-faith, multi-purpose center on ground zero. And that is perhaps the way that you have become best known in the media. I'm not sure it gives full justice to the, uh, to the depth of your intentions. But a prophet offers also hope based on a vision and that is what Imam Faisal does, my friends, in this book, Moving the Mountain. And I'm sure that you will let us take part of your reasoned and seasoned optimism in this book regarding the power of faith in God and goodwill among humankind. But this is uh, my final point and not the least important. Let me give you one pointer into this book, Moving the Mountain. It has to do with contentious terms, Sharia and Fiqh, Islamic law implemented, Islamic jurisprudence, philosophy of law. Imam Faisal recounts an episode where a young Muslim scholar asks his teacher, your father, Dr. Muhammad Abdelouf, about advice in a certain issue of how to interpret Islamic law. When you meet this man, he no longer remembers uh, what the question was, but he remembers how your father answered the question. He said, he gave me a menu of answers. A menu of answers. And I'm sure that the bishop and the professor Christa Stendhal would have loved this metaphor <laughs> and the method. A menu of answers. And I'm sure that is what you will give us today. So, without further ado, I will now ask you to spread the table 
whet, up, uh, whet our appetite because I'm sure we will not be satisfied when you stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is such a wonderful introduction. I just wanted to give a lecture. I mean, you did better than I. <laughs> <laughs> Could we move this table so uh, I can see eye to eye to our uh, the standout family? I think if you move it this way, just move it this way. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you so much. Imam Faisal decided to uh, make this, journey, this uh, lecture into a kind of a talk show. So that is what we will have here. So I will, I will ask uh, Imam Faisal some questions. And uh, then when we've uh, exhausted my questions, we will open the floor so that you will also be able to, to ask some questions. And we will we'll go on till, until, I think, half past four. And then there will be refreshments outside and the opportunity for more informal mingling and so on. So, a very warm, warm welcome to you. Thank you so Imam much, Sandra uh, and Helena, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'd like to thank you and thank my good friend Jan for his extremely wonderful introduction to me, and uh, I hope I can get out of the door. My head is sort of expanding. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, the, the Diocese of Stockholm. I'd like to thank the Center for Interfaith Dialogue, the Paideia Institute for Jewish Studies, um, I'd like to also thank all of you um, here, the, the Dean uh, Hans uh, Ulverbrand, who when he approached me said, my name is Hansen. <laughs> uh, so you have to look handsome too, you are a handsome man. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, uh, as, the, as the Swedish people are all very handsome looking people. Uh, very good. You, uh, you went during the Viking era. The, the images we have is, of the going, taking all the most beautiful women and most, you know, people from the lower part of Europe, and so you have a very high ratio of attractive people. That's <laughs> true. And all of you here, the Reverend Brigitte Winberg, Reverend Amika Wiren, and, uh, and and certainly all of you here. I'm very grateful to you. I'm grateful to uh, to to the. Uh, I mean, I I I I know Chris Stan not very well, but he's in my. I have his email address as Krista underscore, underscore Stendhal at harvard.edu from quite a number of years ago, actually. And so good to see Britta and, and Anna here. And you know, it's so, so good to, to see you and to uh, continue the relationship in this form. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's great to be here in Stockholm for the first time. I've always had images. And thank you for the warmth of the people and the warmth of the weather as well. <laughs> Yeah, we raised that for you. Special prayers, both the Christian, the Muslim, and the Jewish community. Yes, so, you, have, you have connections. Yeah. Well, uh, when I read your, your book, uh, Moving the Mountain, I was struck by how you tell your own personal story and about your own faith journey. And I think it's in interfaith dialogue, it's very important to start in storytelling, start in the personal story where we can, I think we often can meet in the religious experience. So will you tell us something about your, about yourself, about your story? Certainly. In fact, the, the, when, I, when I had the contract to write, to publish this book, the publisher said, it was after the so-called Ground Zero uh, event, which made me uh, an object of, of uh, a lot of emotion, passion. At that time, I, I felt I related to Jesus Christ, you know, in a very special way. To be accused of that which we are innocent, to be crucified in the media, you know, to, to have uh, people whom you thought close to you turn away from you, like, you know, when, when Peter in the Bible supposed, supposed, I don't know this man, three times before the cock will grow, you will you repudiate me. I was repudiated by people whom I thought would be close to me, had people whom I didn't feel comfortable with want to be close to me because of the media attention, because they wanted to be part of the media. It was a very, very strange, strange experience. <coughs> but after that, when, when, uh, when Simon Schuster agreed to, to, to have me published, he said, we want this book to be your calling card to uh, middle America. And he said, we want this you to, we want to tell your story. And, and so I tried for the first time to write a book which was um, somewhat uh, autobiographical in terms of important aspects of my journey, 
and how it relates to, to the work that I have done and that I'm doing. I was born in Kuwait in 1948. I'll be celebrating my 65th birthday in two weeks. Um, of Egyptian parents. My father was a graduate of Al-Azhar University, which was the major Islamic seminary in the Sunni Muslim world. Uh, when I was 18 months, my father was sent to England as a student. I lived five years in Cambridge. And when I was six, we came back, so my first memories are of England. My first language that I spoke was English. My first attachments was to, you know, uh, fried, uh, you know, fish and chips and, and malt vinegar. Um, my first ambitions was to be a proverbial train driver, which every young English boy wants to be. So I grew up in that environment. Uh, my father came back to Egypt, and after not even four months, he was transferred to Malaysia. It was then a British colony, still called the Federation of Malaya. And I just spent 10 years there until the age of 16. So my most formative years, and by the time I was around 11, 12, I began to to ask, to begin to search for my own identity, uh, because I um, I knew I was not English, and yet I was attached to, uh, to to English and English culture and English education in a very big way. And I was not Malay; I was seen as an outsider, although my family was respected um, because the Malays are Muslims and they respected my father. So although I was respected, I was not really, I was still an outsider. Um, and then after coming back to Egypt for about 11 months, and by the way, we went to Egypt for vacation, even when I, when I went back to Egypt, I was a stranger. In the Khawaga, they would call me, you know, you're speaking with a funny accent. Um, so even in my own country, I was not uh, fully seen as one of the guys. And then at the age of 17, my father was transferred to America. So starting around the age of 11, 12, I began to ask myself, who am I? What am I? Um, and I struggled with this question for until I was about 25, until I resolved it. And as I tried to examine and unpack myself, I tried to examine and identify who am I in each of the components of, of myself. So I looked at my physiology, my physiology changed, you know, I had baby pictures, my mother had an album of photos at different phases of my life, and I, didn't, I looked different every few years. Um, as I looked at my ambitions, my ambitions shifted also over the years from wanting to be the engine driver to wanting to be an actor, a film star, a musician, a music director, a scientist. And then when I was in high school at 14, 15, studying Shakespeare, to be or not to be Hamlet, that was the question. That was my question, my quest. And then I realized that the question that people were asking me, what do you want to be, Faisal, when you grow up, was actually not the right question. They were asking me, what do you want to do? And I could do different things, and I did different things. I did different things even in the course of a day. You know, I did my homework, I played football with my friends, I did different things. And at different times in one's life, I can do different careers. But it then made me ask, well, what does, it, what does being mean? What does it mean to be? And who is myself? Who am I? What am I all about? What is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of my being on this earth? Um, so my, and my emotions changed. Every, every uh, you know, when I was six years old, I was in love with my teacher. When she got married, I felt heartbroken. <laughs> and then every two years, I had a crush on another girl. Mm -hmm. oh, this girl doesn't look at me, I will die. Yeah. And then two years later, I think, what was I thinking about, you know? And, 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 and seeing not only the, the, the mortality of my emotions, but even the mortality of my emotional commitments. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure some of you have experienced it, but nothing is more traumatic than to make an emotional commitment to somebody, say, yes, I will love you for the rest of my life. And then one day, could be a few months later, a few years later, you wake up one morning and all of a sudden, overnight, from having incredible feelings of passion and love, to feel that somebody has taken a vacuum cleaner 
and just vacuum, suck those feelings out of your heart, and overnight you just have no feelings for this person. No love, no hate, just nothing. And you find yourself unable to respond with any sense of emotion. So the, the feeling of the, the mortality of, of one's, or, or the changeability, the expiration dates, as a friend of mine calls it, on my emotions, on my ambitions, on my so forth. And yet, in spite of all of this, there's still this conviction that I'm still the same I. I have changed, but yet there's an I within me that hasn't changed. The question that I have, well, who is this I? Why do I still feel that there is something within me that is still the same self, the same Faisal? What is that? Where does that Faisal lie? And that is what prompted my religious quest. And I found the answer only in my religious quest, my spiritual journey. Uh, the short answer is I defined the eternal self, the timeless Faisal, as the locus of my soul. This, my soul. And by that I mean only the, 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 the life force within me, but also the locus of my will and the locus of my, my life, my essential life. And in terms of, in terms of my religiosity, when, when God tells us that he created us in his image, we're all created with divine image. It's the divine image within us that is our soul. And um, in, in Islamic, in the Quran, God describes the creation of Adam, where God tells the angels, when I shall have formed Adam from the clay of the earth, and shall have breathed into him of my soul. When I have to be him of Rohi, Faqa'ala Sajidin. Yan speaks Arabic better than I do. So. Well, your mom's here also. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the, the we are so therefore the you might say that the the divine perspective or the divine view or the definition of a human being is not geo uh, you know not earth centered but theocentric the definition and the, therefore God defines us as a breath of His soul or an image of the of divinity you have this concept of Christianity imago dei the image of the divine, and, and therefore it is that image of the divine that, that I define myself in. And then I had to recalibrate myself that way. And um, when I defined myself that way, I was released from the attachment to my to cultural things. So when the part of me that was English, that was Arab, that was Malay, was no longer part of my essential self, was part of the broader self, but because I narrowed my definition to that part, I could then go to any part of the world and, and embrace it and, and be part of it in, in, a, in a kind of an internally experienced way. So I come to Stockholm and I can't wait to have my fried herring and knackbrot, which you promised me, and I'm still waiting to have that, you see. But to, be, to, to go to every culture and to be able to enjoy it in an internal way, I think is part of a, a newfound freedom and ability to enjoy and to relate to not only different cultures but to different people in in um, in, in a very special way, which takes uh, the the uh, which tra which kind of like bridges from the I thou relationship to an I I relationship. I mean, to me, the what I've learned from the Sufi tradition, the spiritual tradition where you merge yourself with God, the, the kind of the, the to, to, to merge yourself with the Creator, so you become um, a tool of the, I mean, all of us have experienced like this, moments like this, where we felt a, a, a oneness with, with the Creator. Uh, and um, uh, when you do that, when you have that, then it opens yourself to a sense of oneness with all of humanity as well. So that's, that's my story. And that, that basically also has had an impact upon, upon what I've done. Yes, could you tell us something of how this has well, impacted I, I, your yeah, work I, as an imam in the US? Sure. I, I mean, uh, this also has had an impact upon, um, upon an important part of my work. I, I feel from my studies of religion, both Islam and other religions, 
um, that when a religion goes from its original country to other cultures, it restates itself in those societies. Uh, and, and this restatement is something which has happened throughout history, and it's something which will continue to happen. It's part of the eternal challenge of every, of every religion. Every religious tradition has this challenge, which is, what are the eternal principles of our faith, the timeless principles of the faith, the, the imago dei portion of our faith? And how do we express this eternal portion, the eternal values of our faith, in different contexts of time and space? Different, the same country in a different generation, or, or same time, different times, in a different, in a different country and culture. Uh, so if you take the, the path of Christianity, for example, when Christianity spread from Palestine to the world in which it is today, even the names of your churches have the countries associated with them. So you have the Coptic Church in Egypt, the Syrian, Greek, and Russian Orthodox churches. You have the Rome, when, when Constantine the adopted Christianity, became the Roman Catholic Church. And I understand you have here the Swedish Lutheran Church, not just the Lutheran Church, the Swedish, the Church of Sweden. Um, so, so the fact that the Dutch Reformed Church, the Anglican Church, and then when the, um, when the, when the Americans uh, said, decided that they, had, they, couldn't, they couldn't recognize King George anymore, and the king was the head of the Church of England, so they had to change their name to the Episcopalian Church. So you can see how not only the narrative of church and, and, the, and the church state issue has, has shaped not only the expressions of religions, the names of the churches in different parts, but part of what's important is to recognize that when that happens, the, the religion becomes seen as a local thing, not as a foreign thing anymore. So Swedish Christians don't think of Christianity as a Palestinian religion. They think of it as a Swedish religion. The Germans think of it as a German religion. The Italians think of it as an Italian religion. They don't think of it as another, another religion. Now the same thing has happened with Islam. We don't call it you know, the, 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 the Greek, I mean, Turkish Islam or Egyptian Islam. Or, but this happened in terms of our jurisprudence. When Islam spread from the Hejaz, like a Medina where the Prophet was born and lived and died, and, it, and then uh, spread to different parts of the, the traditional, what we call the Muslim world. This is how you had the beginnings of the different schools of jurisprudence. Because Islam shares with Judaism that it's a rule of law. And therefore, what does the law say about a particular issue? So different interpretations developed. This is how we have the different, what you call madahib or madhabs. It began, you know, around ind individual teachers or jurists who were in Abu Hanifa in, in what is Iraq today, uh, Imam Malik who was in Medina, Imam Shafi'i who was in Egypt and Iraq, Iraq first and then Egypt. Um, so, so you have the Shafi'i Madhab. These are different interpretations of jurisprudence. But not only in terms of jurisprudence, in terms of all the expressions of culture. So if you look at the architecture of mosques, for example, in, in Egypt, the Fatimid architecture or the architecture of mosques in, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Turkey, in, in Iran, in India. You have distinctive forms of architecture. You have forms of music that was developed. Uh, the musical uh, Qawwali music in, in, in India, uh, you know, which is very, very popular. It's distinctive Indian sound, but it is Islamic because it came out of a religious expression. And I had the opportunity to to actually travel on a cruise from from uh, from Athens to Turkey and stopping in various monasteries, and I happened to hear some Greek Orthodox uh, monks chanting, and the music was exactly the same music as Sufis in Turkey. I could hear the same musical uh, cadences and and notes. So you see how people have adopted from each other, but expressing each other. So therefore. Part of my work right now in America is to evolve our community from being Muslims in America who are immigrants, who have experienced our faith as a cultural expression, 
to shape what I call an American Islamic identity. Because until that happens, we are seen as alien. But once we express our religion in, in the vocabulary, or the cultural vocabulary, the jurisprudence, the laws of America, then we are seen as local. This happened to not only, this has happened to Jews when they came to America, to Catholics when they came to America. When, once they were able to express themselves in the, norm, in the normative, what I call the normative vocabulary of their society, then they become accepted as local. So American Catholics went through problems, now they're accepted. American Jews went through problems, now they're accepted in America. We are going through the same journey as American Catholics, American Jews, and even American Protestants when they came to America in terms of Americanizing their faith. And that I think is a very important part of our work. And I have been able to articulate it in, uh, in, in, in terms that are consistent with our own history. Because when I first spoke about it, I, I made a mistake of calling it an American Islam. I said, what do you mean by American Islam? There's only one Islam. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there is one Islam in terms of our creed, in terms of our uh, rituals. But if you go to different Muslim countries, you will see the different expressions. So I've now learned and reframed it as an American Islamic identity, an American Islamic culture, as a, a sense of who we are. But what is always important in this it is for us to also recognize that the importance of an authentic uh, religious tradition is that it must be anchored in the Imago Dei. So we too, as a what makes a, a religious tradition in authentic is that it must, it must come and it, it must be based on, a, on, a, on an experience of the divine. Because religion, without the, without the love of God, without the... Um, is, is Reverend Ulf here? He's not. He's not with us. Yeah. He was telling me how he was, in, in, when he was in Egypt, and we were telling him the sweetness, the, what we call in Abhalat al-Iman, the Prophet used to speak about the sweetness of faith. If you don't have the sweetness of faith in your heart and your tongue, then your religion is, is really empty. It's like, a, it's like a body without a soul. And we know what happens to a body without a soul. It stinks within a couple of days. You only know, just bury it. You can't have it next to you very long. Um, and, and unfortunately, I believe that is part of the challenge that we, that religion is in my own face today, when it is expressed, when it is, when it is divorced from its spiritual grounding, then it becomes to me uh, really not an expression of the divine, but rather an abuse of the divine imperative. Mm -hmm. I think that many uh, Swedish Muslims can identify a bit with what you say about developing this American Muslim identity. Sometimes we call about blue and yellow Islam in Sweden. You know, the Swedish flag is blue and yellow. So I think there's a similar urge to, to find w what does it mean to be Muslim in this country. But then I think in all religions, I think many of us realize, as you say, that religion develops in time and space. But then there are some, I think, who, who uh, don't acknowledge that, who says that there's, there's just one way, and that is as it was just in the beginning in Arabia in the 17th, 7th century or in, in the first decades of the Christian faith and so on. And isn't that a great challenge? It is, it is. Unfortunately, most people don't realize that we all live and are somewhat imprisoned by certain myths. And I use myth not in the negative sense only, even in the positive sense. Uh, we, we have certain perceptions which have become adopted and become institutionalized. And, and we are imprisoned by language. Uh, this is why in, in, the, in the Sufi tradition, we, we, we are taught and encouraged to, to break these idols because we see reality through a grid. And we see through a, a grid. And, and our concepts are like words. So instead of the experience of love, you get stuck in the word love or hope or whatever it might be. And if you are Greek or study Greek, then is it eros, is it agape, is it, I forgot the third word now, you know. 
in, in Greek. So which kind of love are you referring to? But if you experience that reality, you go beyond the idolatry of the, of the words to what the experience is all about. Uh, so in this spiritual tradition, we are intended to, to break these idols that hold us in. So we are, you know, we, even our names are idols. Jesus did not think of himself as a Christian. Now that his followers think of themselves as Christians, they thought of themselves as a revival of the Jewish, of the, of the tradition. It wasn't even a Jewish tradition, because there were all these prophets. Each prophet didn't come to start a new religion whether it was you know, from Abraham and David and Solomon and all these prophets came to remind people of God. It's about God's religion. It's not about the religion of a particular prophet. Now we are attached to, we have developed names that attach ourselves to certain traditions. And one, of the, one of my favorite stories is of a, of a uh, this was a reverend who in his student years from the deep south in America, went to study a seminary up north, and he came back for Christmas and telling his mother, you know, Ma, Jesus was, was a Jew. I said, what rubbish are they teaching you out there in this seminary up in New York? You know, Jesus was a good Christian, obviously. What are you talking about? So people tend to have myths, and the challenges that we have, those of us who are students of religion, we understand these nuances. And, and, and but the simple-minded folk, they think in terms of these myths, and. When you shatter their myths, you shatter their, their, their comfort level. But, but, but the experience of God always shatters your comfort level. I mean, the, the nature of the divine experience is that, I mean, to us, the, the, the expression of faith, la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God. There's no reality but, but the absolute reality it, it is, is one which we are we are fated to experience in our day-to-day -day lives the mortality of everything, even of our ideas. So to, to, to the, the truth of religion is experienced when you shatter all these things, these grids that you get attached with and go directly to the experience of reality. Uh, and and um, that's, that's, that's the challenge that we have. And, but it's an important challenge for us to rise to because it is when we rise to that challenge and we meet it that we then find the common ground that we all meet on, which is the love of God. I mean, Jesus, when Jesus was asked, and Jesus, by the way, is a highly regarded prophet in our religious tradition, and in the Sufi tradition, he is regarded as the sheikh of all the Sufis, because we believe that every prophet came with a particular mission with a particular signature, and I can use that word. So uh, Joseph came uh, with the signature of dream interpretation, interpretation of dreams, interpretation of signs. Um, uh, Moses came with the law, his signature was a law. Jesus' signature was about spirituality, about how to break all those idols that stand between you and the experience of the divine. And uh, Muhammad, to, uh, we believe, came as to, to basically as a final overture to, 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 to reiterate <coughs> all of these principles. And so the Sufi masters in our tradition are the, the, uh, those who, who teach us how to uh, go through such an experience where we break the idols of our, of our perceptions and, 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 and face and experience and be touched directly by God. You seem to say that the experience of God is the same whatever your religion is and I want to ask you because sometimes we say well we all believe in the same God and that sounds very yeah that sounds reasonable if we don't think there are many gods but then quite often we are chastised by people say how can you say that how do you know that the Muslim and the, and the Jew and the Christian believe in the same God because we have different stories and different images so how would you answer that question do we believe in the same God, and then in what sense? How well, can you explain that? I mean, I mean, every tradition has developed a theology uh, and, and a, uh, um, an orthodoxy. So there is an orthodoxy in Christianity, there's an orthodoxy in Judaism, an orthodoxy in Islam. And I use the word orthodoxy not, not, with, a, not with a capital O, meaning, meaning uh, 
Orthodox Jews as opposed to the Orthodox Church. I don't mean it in that sense. I mean it in the sense of things that if you are, if you are, if you accept this, you are part of the religion. You know, so, uh, in in Christianity today, if you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, you are admitted into the the body of Christ. You are a member of the Christian faith community. Uh, you don't have to do any particular ritual thing. If you, as long as you believe that, that's fundamental. Uh, as a Jew, there's an orthodoxy of prax of praxis. If you observe the Sabbath, if you you know observe the dietary laws, whatever, then you are accepted as a, as a Jew. The, the 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 challenge with Judaism is that Jew to be a Jew is not only a religious thing; it's become a, a religious thing and a cultural thing, a people thing. So it it's it's not purely a uh, a religious thing. To be a Muslim is to believe that there is only one God and that you, that Muhammad is his prophet. So if you believe that, you're accepted into the Ummah of, of, of Islam. And you have flexibility in other things. But you have to accept the Quran. There's a number of things, like about a dozen items. You have to believe the Quran is the little word of God. You have to believe in the, in, in, in the, in the attributes of God as being, you know, God is absolute, He's almighty, perfect. We can't say God is uh, weak or God is, you know, contradictory, and that is that you will be considered uh, a heretic in, in Islam if you believe that. So we have an orthodoxy of principles in each particular faith that accepts us as that. But that's the theological, the the, the kind of like the cerebral brain aspect of things. Um, but that's like a person who talks about love and has never fallen in love. Or a person who has had physical intimacy with a man and a woman and knows that or doesn't know it. And when we were kids, when we didn't before we had sex, we used to talk to our friends, what is sex like? We didn't know what it was all about. And but those who finally experienced it were quiet. <laughs> but those who didn't experience it would yak endlessly about it. <laughs> what is it like? You know, what is it about? You didn't know what it's about. But once you know why you just don't talk about it very much anymore. The same to people who don't, who, who, who don't know about God. People who have never experienced God, they yak endlessly about it. But once you experience, when you experience God, you actually can't speak. You actually feel struck dumb. And, and you are humbled by, 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 by that experience where you are face to face with, with absolute power, absolute love, absolute tenderness. And you know it directly. And you know that you can't even talk about it because it's as difficult to describe as to describe love to someone who has never loved. But this is why Sufis talk the language of love, whether it's Rumi, and they talk the language of universality. And Rumi says, come, come, whoever you are, one of his famous poems. You know, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, an atheist or a Jew, Christian, uh, Serbian, whatever, Zoroastrian, fire worshiper, all are welcome. Because it's that it's that which makes you, you know. So all it's all about falling in love with God. I mean, Jesus said the two major commandments when he has asked, "What's the major command?" So love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your um, mind. And do it in different orders. But I'm conflating two two gospels here. And then he says the second command, which he equates to the first in importance, is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says, upon these two commandments hangs all of the law and all of the prophets. And in fact, Islamic law, Sharia law, is based upon these two commandments. So the, we have uh, the, the first the good set of laws pertaining to what you might call love of God. We call the ibadat, he was put into worship of God. <coughs> and then mu'amalat, which is uh, uh, laws pertaining to, you know, I say, civil, you know, civil law or worldly, worldly matters. But the question of love is very difficult to understand and very difficult to explain. Because when you try to project love, I mean, I once gave some, a couple of sermons on this, when you say, I love my wife, I love my daughter, I love lamb chops, I love fried herring and knacker bread. Um, <laughs> What do you say? I love Mozart. Uh, I love I love mathematics. Now, what is the dynamic in each case? 
When you say, I love my wife, I love my daughter, there are things that express love to my wife which are forbidden you know, to my daughter. It is a sin. Uh, when I say I love, you know, fried herring, you don't have to eat it. You don't love, you love my daughter, my wife, the same way I love herring, and she fry it and eat it. Uh, when I say you love Mozart, you know, it's an act of listening. When you say I love mathematics, it's an act of thinking. But what does it mean then to say I love God? How do you project? And of course, I mean, that in Christianity, you have the sacrament of the Mass. This is my body and this is my blood. So you are ingesting into yourself symbolically uh, God. And this is kind of a symbolic way in which you are expressing a kind of love of divine, but does, uh, which is very um, um, kind of like loving lamb chops kind of a, kind of a love. But, but how do you love God? You know, it's, it's not as easy as it is. So when you think about the act of love of, of God, uh, it, it projects itself into many dimensions of the human experience. But at, at its fundamental source, is, it is the, the contact between God and, and your soul that fires you up in a particular way and makes you radiate in a whole a way that um, only those who've experienced know it, and I'm sure many people here have. I think one day, I think you and I should run a seminar on food as a means and symbol of interfaith dialogue. But, uh, That's very important. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah. Yeah, we're not going to that now, I think, but... Why not? <laughs> time is time is running up. But oh, you can, time. yeah. I, I, I was going to ask you, you. You can, you can perhaps you can weave some food into this because I was going to ask you why is interfaith dialogue and engagement important? Well, I think it's important. Like eating for, and drinking, you could say. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's 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 many ways of talking about it. I think I mean it's like when you study a different language. People think if you study another language, you will, you will lose your own or you're betraying your own. Uh, in fact, when you study another language, you appreciate your own language better. You will understand, but you will also appreciate things in the other language that your own language doesn't have. And you'll appreciate things in your language that the other language doesn't have. And it will broaden your experience. And then you will come to the recognition that many words are borrowed. You know, you think you're speaking Swedish. And you speak English, and I heard these words are similar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this word is similar in French, and we have it here. This Arabic word is chemistry is an Arabic word. Oh, I didn't know that. Algebra is an Arabic. You begin to realize how much you have in common. How much, but you also recognize the limits of language. Mm -hmm. So you, you realize that, okay, there's something special about the, 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 the Christian. Um, tradition, something valuable about the Jewish tradition, something valuable about the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu tradition, uh, and, and at each tradition expresses one aspect of, uh, of, the, of the religious experience. Um, and, and then you learn from each other. And I mean, the fact of the matter is that all religions have learned from each other. But it also teaches us to recognize there's something that the different religions are pointing, that religions are not absolute absolutes in themselves, but are rather a kind of language that, that tries to express uh, a, a, a universal human experience. And there are different ways of, of, of looking at this experience. For example, I don't know the Eskimo language, I'm told that in Eskimo language there's no one word for snow. Mm. But it's like 17 words or something like that. You know, spring snow, fall snow. We probably have it here in the northern part of, uh, of Sweden. You know, light snow, wet snow, whatever it is. Um, because that's the way they see reality. But to be able to make that comparison between different languages is important. Uh, and um, because at the end of the day, Religion is about God, and it's about the truest meaning of what it means to be human. And, um, and the human journey, the human quest, is really about, about that journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, we believe, and God says in the Quran, 
And God created us in order to test us. God, God created humankind. God created death and life, God says. To test you, which of you are best in your actions. Um, and that's why we have a day of judgment. We have a resurrection in heaven and hell. This is the purpose that we were created. We were created to, to, um, to be tested as, in, in Christian language, to be we are children of God. In the Christian. But what does it mean to be children of God? We are images of God. So each human being is, is a mirror in which God sees itself. And to use this to the, the, the uh, Sufi language, our purpose is to perfect our mirror so that it's, we do, God does not, you know, a bad mirror sort of like uh, makes your eyes look funny and, you know, it does not reflect you well. So it's to be a very accurate mirror for, for, for the divine reality and the divine imperatives that God has uh, demanded upon us. I think that's one of the most important values of interfaith uh, engagement in dialogue. But then, that's on the vertical dimension. On the horizontal dimension, because that's what the symbol of the cross is, you know, the two commandments, and I venture to speculate that the reason why the vertical commandment is more important is why the vertical dimension is a bit longer than the horizontal dimension. So we have the symbolism of the cross here, in both the love of God and the love of humankind and our responsibility as stewards of the earth. But then, how do we engage with, with each other? And I think interfaith dialogue at its best is that it, 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 um, it, it demands or it calls upon those of us from different faith traditions to address the common challenges that human beings face. So we are to work together to, to bring greater harmony, to, to, to address conflicts, um, but very often we create conflicts too. When we do not, when we're not grounded in the love of God, then we 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 are a very powerful source of conflicts. But I think interfaith engagement, interfaith cooperation, uh, is required today because many conflicts are conflicts in which religions are either or religious perspective is brought to bear, and therefore has to be part of the solution. Like in Israel, Palestine, for example, the, the 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 ownership of land at certain sites is allied to different religious mm -hmm. claims upon it, uh, and um, and yet to deal with the the important issues of the day, whether it's the environment, whether it's you know uh, how do we how do we uh, make sure that the earth is a safe place for our uh, descendants, our grandchildren, uh, is is part of the work which. I believe that religious uh, spokespeople, religious leaders, religious communities um, have important things to say and have, an, uh, have a, an important contribution to make. Yeah, you talked about uh, being, being Muslim in non-Muslim majority societies. So what would you say can Muslims contribute to the non-Muslim majority societies where they emigrate? And also, perhaps, what can non-Muslims contribute in, in, in Muslim society? Well, I, I'm, uh, we can certainly contribute um, our different perspectives, those are two, as I just mentioned. I believe that, uh, that th this cross-fertilization of ideas, of experiences, is something which has happened throughout human history, and it's valuable to be continued. For example, I hear my non-Muslim friends tell me, you know, you Muslims are so devout, you know, I mean, the, the way you fast, my God, from <laughs> morning to sunset, makes us, what we do for Lent is really like, our way to do is give up chocolate or give up something like that. So there's a sense of, um, uh, of uh, what you were telling me earlier, the idea of holy envy, the idea of, um, you know, we see something in another tradition that we like, which prompts us to be, you know, as God says in the Quran, compete in good works with the, the, with the believers. So the sense of competition, I think that's one thing which certainly uh, we, we, we give to each other. Uh, I, I believe that as Muslims, we are very good in the first commandment. 
we pray five times a day, mm -hmm. we, we um, you know, we fast and we go to pilgrimage and it's wonderful and all that. We are terrible in the second commandment. Mm. Muslims don't love each other very well. They don't well, all Christians do, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I believe Christians do very well in that. And, and, you know, what, 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 I mean, in fact, there's a famous saying, there's a famous um, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, who was the who was the, uh, the chief mufti in Sheikh al-Azhar, uh, he died in 1905. He went to France, you know, sometime in the 1800s, and he said, he was so impressed with, you know, he said, I went to France, I saw Islam, and no Muslims. I come to Egypt, and I see Muslims, but no Islam. <laughs> so in a sense, he was describing this sentiment, and I think this is certainly something that, that I mean, I know those of us who have lived in non-Muslim societies, we have observed how Western societies have developed. Uh, so, in fact, Muslims, that when they go back to their country, have tried to bring about democratic principles, democratic regimes, and the kind of uh, justice, the kind of um, good governance that we see in Western societies and Christian majority societies today. So, it's this kind of exchange, I think, that you know, we Muslims need to learn from Christians. And, and Jews, the Jews have a great sense of community. We're supposed to be an Ummah. Where is the Ummah today? People talk about the Ummah as a concept, but look at the infighting that, that we exist. Look at the suicide bombing at that, that time. Mean, first, the suicide is haram. I mean, how, to me, the, one of the worst problems today in the Muslim world is the, is the blight of extremism, mm. uh, which to me comes from a lack of spirituality and also the, the deployment of religion for purposes of power, and, and subjugation of others. Uh, and this really is the biggest tragedy today. Mm. And, and we need to work together on that. So that's, a, to me, probably the, if there's, uh, uh, the most important, to me, uh, front burner issue, which interfaith cooperation uh, should be um, done, is in this area of, uh, of combating extremism, mm. which is why the idea of this movement of moderates. Now, after 9-11, the mantra I used to hear in New York is, where are the moderate Muslims? Why don't they speak out? When we speak out, we don't get the attention of the news because our, our things are not media sexy, you know, they're not media attractive. Um, so uh, that's the challenge today. But, but if you look at the, the phenomenon of extremism, the psychology of extremism, extremists tend to fuel other extremists. So Muslim extremists who do bad things result in Western people saying bad things about Islam. So then you have a, a military general in the U.S. says, we're in Iraq too, this is a crusade against Islam. And people get upset in the Muslim world. They kill some, you know, bomb some Western embassy. And then, you know, a pastor in Florida decides to burn the Quran. This is an evil religion. And then, you know, some Afghans kill six uh, Europeans working for the United Nations in Afghanistan. So the extremists fuel each other. And and, and what they do is that they actually combat the moderates in their tradition. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, it was a Jewish extremist who killed Isaac Rabin, for example, uh, who tried to, to, to do, because it's the moderates who create everything, make everything happen. So we need to, to, to develop coalitions of moderates. Mm -hmm. Even to, today, what's happened in the United States, I mean, as we're speaking, the United States government is shut down. Mm. Why? Because extremist right wing the Tea Party Republicans have, have, uh, have uh, taken over the discourse. Moderate Republicans like Richard Luger have been chased, literally chased out of the party. And, and, and this is what extremism in the Republican Party has led to. So extremism is not only religious, it's, it's political. Uh, and even I was at a, um, a conference a year ago for, at the Malaysian uh, Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund, and they had a couple of speakers from Hong Kong who talked about the 2008 economic crisis and meltdown, and attributed to to extreme greed in in the financial sector. And one of them who was a Buddhist talked about the Buddhist or Confucianist principle of the way of the moderate way. You have to bring back the way of the moderate way. So the idea of moderates then and. Uh, cooperating together across ideological differences to combat extremism, politically, economically, ideologically, is, I think, important. 
And it's nothing new. I mean, what, the, 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 the scourge of communism, of, 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 uh, of Stalinism, of, uh, of fascism, is about extremism packaged in, in communist and atheistic ideology. So you can have, you can have uh, extremism in, in any ideolo ideology or religious tradition. Um, you know, you had it during the Inquisition in Spain. Uh, now we Muslims are combating extremism. That's the biggest difficulty we have. Uh, and if you look even in Egypt, it's again uh, extreme attitudes from one side against the other. And, and you have to change, you have to moderate that and, and, and implement a different system to bring peace and harmony in those spaces. So this to me, I think, is perhaps one of the most important aspects today of interfaith dialogue in what I call the horizontal uh, dimension of work. Thank you so much. I think now this room is bursting with questions. You've raised a lot of issues and I think that people would like to perhaps put so Questions. It's so. either that or we've completely <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> roll them over. Annika, can you help and take a mic and, uh, mm -hmm. and please keep your, arms, uh, your, your questions short so that everyone, so we don't get a few extra uh, lectures and so on. We have one person here and... Yes. Yeah. And if you if you identify yourselves, I think Christina was first and then next. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is, is shy about putting a question in, in English, you can put it in Swedish and we'll help translate. So thank you very much for your presentation and the talk. My name is Christina Hagvist, I work in Church of Sweden, mainly with refugee migration issues. You said that Muslims are very good in the first commandment and terrible in the second. So a very short but probably not too easy question is what, should, how, what do you see as crucial for making that second commandment also be strong in the Muslim world? The most effective tool with Muslims is to quote the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet to them. So you go to the Quran Go to the things the Prophet said. The Prophet said this. The Prophet did this. The, you know, the Quran says this, um, and and to use those verses as your argument with Muslims. Um, and and you know, there are many teaching moments like that, and many we don't know our own history very often. Um, for example, I. I mentioned to, to Muslims the, the, the way the reason why do we practice, why did we fast the tenth of Muharram, for example? You know, the Prophet when, when he this was before Ramadan was the month of Ramadan was given as a commandment to fast. The Prophet when he went to Medina, there were Jewish tribes there, they fasted Yom Kippur, the tenth of the new year, which is the tenth Muharram is our first month of the year. So he was, so he asked them why they fasted, and he says, we fast, although this is not what my rabbi friends tell me, it's not historically accurate. But, they, but according to our tradition, uh, the Jews told him this was the day that, uh, that, uh, that God saved the, the children of Israel from the yoke of Pharaoh, and therefore Moses fasted the tenth day of the new year in gratitude to them. So what did our prophet say? He says, and the bin Musa minkum, is I'm closer to Moses than you are. And he fasted. He fasted um, that day. Until today, many Muslims fast the tenth of Muharram, but they don't know why. <laughs> so if we know this little bit of history and know that it links us to Jews in a special way, that should be something very special. And I, I had a taste of this one year because our, our uh, calendar shifts 11 days, so we don't have a correction every three years. Uh, one year, um, I was fasting, uh, what, one of those optional fasting days, and it so happened to, 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 to align with Christmas. And in the Islamic tradition, I don't know how many of you know this, there's a chapter in the Quran, Quran called the chapter of Mary. And in it, the, the Annunciation, the story of the conception of Jesus, and the birth of Jesus is mentioned. And in the Quranic story, God commands uh, Mary, when, when she gives birth to Jesus, she's commanded to fast on the day that she gives birth to Jesus. 
Now, we don't believe that Jesus was born on December 25th any more than Christian scholars believe it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that that's the day it's, it's, it's honored, and I happened to be fasting that day, I felt a special kinship to Mary on that day. Because I was fasting on the day where Christians believed Jesus was born. And that's the day the Quran says Jesus was born and Mary was commanded to fast that day. So there are many things like that, little, little devices or tools like this from experiences like that. I mean, we've learned to fast certain, you know, together on some days or to, to, to be able to experience the other person's tradition in some way or to experience it through our own tradition in some way. Um, both, so you have both the, the cerebral way of convincing by quoting verses, but the experiential way also is, uh, is very good and helpful when you can and your Muslim friends here will, will, they will tell you how to do it. This is why my, I call a movement of moderates, a coalition, is you put together a task force. You know? So it's like you know, when, when, when you wanted to get along well with, with some girl, you know, when you were dating a girl and you, she said something, she slapped you, said, what did I do wrong? You couldn't figure it out, and you go and ask her, you said that, no wonder she slapped you. Right? So you use your sister to tell you how to relate better with, with girls. So you, you develop key friendships, you know. I mean, what, would, how, what would work with the Jewish community? What would work with the Christian community? What would work with the Muslim community? How about this? So you, you develop particular tools and, and ideas that, that will work. And I think that's my suggestion to you. Uh, I more than narrow, I'm a rabbi. Uh, I always get frightened when people quote, uh, talk about principles. Uh, I'm an American, as you can tell from the accent, and I always think in terms of, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created <coughs> equal. Uh, wonderful words, but uh, these people were slave owners. They didn't include women in the election. They were uh, a beautiful principle, but when it was spelled out, it was spelled out in many ways that were unjust. And when I hear my colleagues, my Orthodox colleagues, talk about halakha, and when I hear Muslims talking about Sharia, I often think about the inequalities that exist in these systems and that they have to be challenged. And I would like to ask you, what are you doing to challenge, I know what we're doing to challenge the inequalities in halakha, and we bring this up very often in our um, International Council of Christians and Jews uh, organizations. But what are you doing in your organization to challenge the inequalities in Sharia? Excellent question. Well, first of all, I mean, we, we, we recognize that both at an individual level and at a collective level, there is a gap between our ideals and our reality. I mean, I would be remiss if I thought I was a perfect Muslim or a perfect believer in any way. I'm always conscious of the fact of my shortcomings, and uh, and as and as a collectivity, we are we also have to be cognizant of that. Um, what we are doing in particular, we have a number of projects, both in terms of women's advancement, and and uh, trying to prevent certain wrongs from being done to women in the name of religion, which is really a travesty of our institution. Uh, we have, uh, and I also have a project on on defining what an Islamic state means because many so-called Islamic states uh, just focus on the penal code and they just really don't focus on the principles of justice. Um, so we, we have, uh, uh, and with our women's project, for example, we've done a number of things. One against uh, what's called female circumcision, an African practice, which, believe it or not, some Muslim scholars like the ex al Azhar said is an, is an Islamic practice, which in when it is not. There's nothing in the Quran or the Hadith which states that it is. It is a horrible practice. It is, uh, it is not even circumcision. It's really, it's really what they call now female genital mutilation. Uh, we have done a project in, in Egypt. We've done a pilot project, which we are now looking for resources to expand it, where we have utilized not only the, the, the faith-based arguments with local people who can argue the issue locally in a particular village in Egypt, but also recognize that there was a, an economic incentive we had to give because the people who used to conduct these, these things 
uh, are like you know the, kind of a mid midwife type tradition, uh, and so we went to those people, usually a barber or a or whatever it was, and we looked at them, and then we dis we discovered we had to address not only the religious issue but the economic issue because if they're going to stop doing that, you you are biting them into a portion of their income. So we we for an investment of only about twenty five hundred dollars in Egypt, we were able to give one of the women's. Uh, she wanted to start a chicken business, which she started. Another one wanted like a hair dryer and <coughs> machine to, to be able to do more service. So it required, it required not only utilizing religious arguments, but also realizing that approach to, to, to make it happen. That's an example of one project. And we did another one in Afghanistan, where we actually found someone locally to teach the the, the so-called imams, the ones who give sermons for Friday prayers, who are very often like a parish priest, not very knowledgeable about the faith, to educate them based on Quran and Hadith about the rights of women. And you've gotten uh, quite good results with that. The, the, the problem we have is resources. And also another problem we have is that when you start doing things like that, those who are opposed to you, because you, there's always an opposition, uh, begin acting against you as well. So it requires it requires constant effort and, and, and more resources. It's like fighting a battle. You know, uh, the, 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 the other side will, will try another tactic to, to get at you. But uh, these are the kind of things that we are doing. And, um, and uh, we, we, uh, we, we feel that, uh, you know, in time and with, with, with more effort and continued effort, uh, we, have made, we have made a difference. And we hope to make more of a difference in the snowball as this time goes on. Thank you, sir. My name is Frank Lorden I am a retired bishop, diocese. You talked about that your, your emotions could be vacuum cleaned. <coughs> cleaned uh, and, uh, uh, my thoughts wandered, what happens in the Muslim tradition if your love to God is vacuum cleaned? You have a very strong feeling of community. Uh, how do you deal on a community level with this problem? That's a very good question. In fact, something happened to me once in my mosque where one of the... My mosque is known as a Sufi mosque, you know, the colloquial expression because people who come to my mosque tend to come from Sufi traditions. This one young man came to me, this is many years back, and he says, if I have a problem, I don't talk to you. I said, what is it about? So I used to do dhikr, you know, dhikr, we repeat God's names, you know, and I do it like 25,000 times a day, la ilallah, la ilallah, And it was sweet. All of a sudden, he said, I can't do it anymore. Have I lost my faith? And, um, um, it's one of the tests. We believe in our tradition that God tests us. And, and the love of God, just like the love of a woman, goes through different, you know, you marry a woman, you think you're gonna live happily ever after. That's a myth that Hollywood tells us, right? <laughs> the real journey just begins, and the difficulties, the difficulties of building a relationship together happens. Um, and St. Augustine wrote about this, the dark night of the soul. Uh, this is part of the part of the tradition. Uh, there's a famous story of a prophet that he um, he was asked. He was approached by you know because the Jews were expecting a prophet to come, and we believe Muhammad was that prophet. Some Jews accepted him, but others didn't. And uh, they asked him three questions, and he uh, he he said, "When I get the revelation, I'll answer it for you." And he waited. The revelation didn't come. According to tradition, some say it was a few months, some say it was even a year or more. It doesn't sound logical if it was that long. But the Arabs began to mock him. They said, oh, your Lord has forsaken you, ya Muhammad. Wadda'ak wa rabbuka, ya Muhammad. And, um, and uh, it was a very difficult time for the Prophet. Uh, and finally the revelation came, wa bukha wa nadi ila saja, ma wadda'ak wa rabbuka wa maqala, by the by the morn and the night when it's still, the Lord has not forsaken, neither has he hated you. So, so we believe in, in our tradition, and, and, and the lesson to the Prophet was, 
because this happened because he didn't say if God wills, inshallah. There's a tendency for us when we when we fall in love with God um, to feel that we are God, you know, and like God is the servant. We tend to feel that you know God is doing my will, you know. We we tend to get pr pride, proud, very proud, and. and in the Sufi tradition, the biggest enemy towards spirituality is pride, um, the ego, um, and um, to say, I did this, and not to say it was God who did this. And, and, and God says in the Quran, even your, even your ability to will to believe in God is dependent upon divine will. So to, 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 uh, we believe that God always will test us, and and part of, part of the correctness of one's spirituality is to always be humble before God, and um, and this to me one of the things which was I always was always afraid of because I have seen how many people on the spiritual path get derailed by all of a sudden thinking of themselves as being egotistic. They become very egotistical and they get derailed. Uh, it's very important to always be humble before God and to be to 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 not to, to not you know say I. So I is the most dangerous word in the spiritual path. It is only it is you. It is you always it is you, O oh Lord. It is this is you who have done it. Whatever I have achieved, it is your actions. It is not mine. You take. I, I can't take credit for it. It's 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 you. Um, that is a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, little book, which is only it's the risala of uh, of, uh, of a Sufi a sheikh in Damascus, Wali Raslan. Uh, his risala, which is only four and a half pages, but one of the most powerful pieces of writing in which he says, each one of you is a, is a hidden shirk. You are, you are. Shirk is association with God, which is one of the great sins in Islam. You are a covert piece of shirk, <laughs> of, of association with God. And you have to remove yourself from you in order for God to unveil himself to you. Um, it's a beautiful piece of writing, very powerful, very deep, very profound, but it speaks to this particular issue uh, in a way that, that, that is very important. Uh, because if not, God will remove himself from you, and we've all gone through those moments where you fell in love with God, and all of a sudden, what happened, God? You know, you've abandoned me. Um, but uh, it, it's part of the journey. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Yasri Khan. I'm the president of the Muslim Peace Movement, uh, uh, one of the fastest and biggest uh, Muslim youth organizations in Sweden. Um, you talked uh, about uh, building a, a Muslim identity, and this is something that we, we are working a lot with currently. Uh, and you talked about creating an American or Swedish Muslim identity. Um, and we share that analysis and we, we really want to find a way to do that. But we are pressed from two sides uh, when we're trying to build the, that identity. On one side, we have the heritage of culture coming from the older generation, where it's very difficult to release uh, the, the cultural context mm -hmm. of the problems arising from a different geographical area and, and release that when it comes to uh, what happens in this geographical area. So, so it gets tangled. And when you have that older generation teaching the structures and the, and the traditions of religion, a lot of the, those uh, cultural things and biases and, and, you know, comes in uh, as well. On the other side, you have the, the, uh, the civil society or the, the assimilation process coming from society where they try uh, where where there is an ongoing process 
where the young Muslims is getting absorbed, uh, but without uh, an, uh, uh, being absorbed without you know a, a traditional or, or like a religious identity, and and trying to fend from both sides at the same times uh, is quite difficult when when trying to build the uh, a working Muslim identity where you can be Swedish as well as Muslim without becoming uh, you know, Swedish without Muslim identity mm -hmm. and without becoming, you know, Muslim without the Swedish identity. Yeah, what's your question? And and so what what are your thoughts in because you you have been working, yeah, you yeah. said like this is something that needs to be done. Yes. But how do you tackle these kind of things in a in a uh, in an efficient way? How can you tackle both these sides and to maintain the, the Swedish Muslim identity or American Muslim identity. I get it. First of all, you ignore the people who are focusing on culture. Okay, you can't. That, that there are people who want to establish cultural centers. They want to still speak, you know, Bangladeshi. So want to. I mean, in, in in New York we have mosques which are Turkish, Albanian, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Arab, and these they are, they are cultural centers. We have an Indonesian, uh, you know. Uh, Islamic Center in, in Queens. Um, you can't change that. That part will continue. You have to focus on the future. You have to focus on the new generation. Focus on the young ones. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to happen in generational time. Secondly, you have to look at the things which are part of your culture. Your jurisprudence is very important. So, so look at the law of the land and look at our own law. I had a discussion just the night before I left with a, uh, uh, the Qadi of Israel. He's a Palestinian, a Palestinian Muslim who is an Israeli citizen. And, and Israel has in its legal structure uh, allowances for the Muslim community in Israel to have their issues of personal status law. This is like marriage, divorce. Uh, issues of uh, uh, inheritance be heard under Islamic law. And this Qadi, and believe it or not, I didn't know this until I met him a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, that is that the, the, they practice the Hanafi Madhab according to the Ottoman Code, because Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire, and they have not discontinued the practice of this code in, 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 in Palestine. So he hears these cases under, and this is a, an example of the application of jurisprudence as a minority. And Muslims have been minorities and still are in many countries. I mean, in Ethiopia, I think our brother, uh, yes, Ahmed Yassin is here from Ethiopia. Uh, the, the first Muslim community outside Algiers <coughs> was in Ethiopia, and they have been a minority ever since. So we have a jurisprudence called Fiqh al Aqaliyat. The jurisprudence of Muslim minorities in Muslim majority societies. So we have a tradition before us, and it still exists today, and practiced in, in, in even so. Shira is practiced in Israel today, uh, in era of personal status law. Uh, so you can construct a system, and we're looking right now to construct a system under the the rules of the American arbitration, because you're allowed to have arbitration. I'm sure in, in many countries, I'm sure Sweden also has a. An arbitration. We spoke about it. Yeah. What's, what's the Swedish word? Shirjedo. Hmm? Shirjedo. This is uh, arbitration. Arbitration. So under the arbitration system, the, the, the Jews have a big dean in New York, where they hear their cases of present status law, which is then considered binding by the authorities. So you look at areas of jurisprudence. So you can have laws which 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 meet with those things. And then the recognition that everything that is not contradictory to Islamic law is shari, is, is, is legally valid. Okay? And the custom of the people, which is not contradictory to our law, is legally valid. So in Malaya, for example, you have the Quran and Adat Malayu. The word Adat Malayu, the Adat or the custom of the Malays, is considered legally binding. So, when Swedes go to do their annual elk hunt, this is the custom of the Swedes, Muslims can do that too. And, you know, so you, you, you become part of, part of the cultural norms. 
Anything which is not, there's nothing in, in our tradition that says you can't go elk hunting once a year and make a big tradition out of it. So participate in that tradition. Okay? So anything which the culture does, you know, in, in terms of, of culture, in terms of music, in terms of architecture. Okay, as I mean, so then this is how you develop a Swedish Islamic identity. The same thing in America. So the, the, the clothing, the, the way, you know, the way of clothing, the way of uh, whatever it might be. So this is how the, the, the culture you begin to develop it. And you develop it generationally. Take a generation or two, and this is how you do it.